Just moving on to um, some of the other provisions. Sorry, the slides have um, jumped a little bit. Um, I pulled risk management out um, separately here, actually, because a lot of people sort of dismiss risk management and say, well, it's just um, sort of, sort of regulated, regulated funds, etc. And, and again, to make the point to you that this only initially applies to European managers, but this, this sort of cliff edge effect, if you want the passport, will apply. There's some quite detailed rules on here, in here. A lot of them, okay, you'll say is common sense, but the really interesting point is this sort of banking-driven requirement to functionally and hierarchically separate your risk management function. Now, you know, I think we all sort of think about risk management as maybe as, as being part of the job of, um, of being a fund manager almost and making uh, sort of investments. And I think there's some particular challenges here for smaller fund managers and maybe the private equity space as well, where um, you've got some, some sort of committees performing these roles in some of the structures, a general partner, etc. Um, how this actually works. So again, I would encourage you to, to focus particularly on the functional and hierarchical separation requirement, just to sort of think about how this would actually work for you, because I think you might find there could be some, some sort of restructuring here to, to try and fit in to what is effectively a sort of banking, a banking type uh, model. Just um, moving on to sort of some of the substance of some of the other rules here, a lot of these will be familiar uh, to those of you who know sort of USITs and, and, and MIFID. Um, again, these are, these are just applicable um, uh, to European-based fund managers. Delegation's a little bit more interested in that in this space, actually. But uh, they're broadly what you'd expect. There's some governance rules and conflicts of interest rules, etc. Delegation's quite interesting because those of you we talk a lot about here about fund managers based in Jersey, but uh, you know there's a significant service industry, of course, uh, where perhaps. Um, services are being provided in, in, in the opposite direction. So in other words, European managers are, are using the services of Jersey-based firms. And here we've got some, some rules that are very relevant around sort of cooperation agreements that need to be in place, the, the equivalence of, um, of some of the delegated fund managers in this regard. And this very interesting provision on what's known as a letterbox entity, which you've had for years in USITS, but no one's ever, ever defined. And in really simple terms, I think this is a key part of saying, are you actually a, a Jersey-based um, alternatives manager or, or, or might, you, might you even be based in, in Europe? And I, I, I would encourage you to really think carefully about how some of the delegation provisions are going to work for you as service providers, but also thinking about how they're going to work for you as fund managers if you're, if you're sort of accessing the, the passport in the future. Just a word on capital has sort of been covered really earlier. Some, some sort of usage type rules, not, not going to create any significant issues on the, the minimum capital that you needed to hold under level one. But some quite interesting issues, perhaps with professional indemnity cover, um, some of the risks around fraud that might need to be covered in the future, they are certainly worth considering. So we talked about sort of operating requirements on the, um, on the fund manager. Uh, this is a manager directive, but indeed there are many things that sort of bite on the fund. Just three of them I thought I'd pick out. You might say valuation is a manager function. Well, um, there are external values envisaged sort of in the directive here. And actually a whole new set of valuation rules. We've never had valuation regulated at all at European level before. I don't think these are going to set the world on fire. Some of them are a very sensible market practice, etc. Others may be just pushing the envelope in the use of, mod of pricing models, for example, and sort of calculating NAV, etc. But some further sort of considerations and, um, and some potential to sort of in increase costs, particularly where you have to get, get some of these, uh, these practices externally reviewed. Liquidity, um, uh, frankly, something I thought wouldn't be a, a contentious issue. Um, I hadn't taken account of the fact that IOSCO, of course, were consulting on elements of liquidity in the context of suspensions at the time. Some, some broadly sensible rules here, I think, on principles, um, particularly in sort of hedge fund space, very interesting. Some of the rules on side pockets and gates. Um, again, not relevant for you in the immediate future, sort of 2013, but certainly relevant for those of you who are looking to access a passport in 2015. And the final one I, I thought I mentioned is this real political hot potato during the level one was, of course, leverage. 
there is significant interest in the private equity space around how some of the um, holdings in sort of portfolio companies are treated, but equally in the hedge fund space, uh, special purpose vehicles, etc. Broadly, we have a sort of USITS plus methodology on leverage. This is relevant to look at because this is something you will need to disclose to your investors. And indeed, depending on the way things shake out, something that you need to think about now because these rules have the potential to apply to the disclosures you'll need to make even under private placement. So not a, not a, a voluminous part of the paper by any means, but I would really encourage you to think through what some of these implications, the implications of having to calculate and disclose your leverage to your investors will, will be. Okay, we've been building up to this this slide and, and indeed great expectation has been, been um, built on what I can sort of say. I, just to, to say, I wrote this slide before yesterday's meeting actually on the Eurostar to Paris. Um, and just to sort of explain the background really. So, so I think there are very good reasons why ESMA has um, uh, deprioritized, if you like, the third country issues. I, I think it was very keen to get input from practitioners on sort of practical and operational issues. Um, just to say what this covers, because I think there's often a lot of confusion about what this, this beast of, called third countries means. And really there are two things I think relevant in this sort of space of 2013. The first, as you've heard from, from, from John and others, is um, really regulators getting together and working out how cooperation uh, operates. The second, though, and this is often sort of overlooked, and this is a point about delegation, particularly those of you who are service providers in the audience, around what equivalence looks like, what, what this, this phrase in the directive called, uh, it, it, where it talks about reg, being registered for the purposes of asset management and being a sort of equivalent firm. And indeed, these are both areas that, that ESMA will be um, putting uh, proposals out, um, we think in the middle of next month, that's when we, we sort of expect the consultation. It won't be another 438 pages, I, I doubt it will even get to 20. And that may give you an idea of the level of detail and just to maybe manage your expectations around that as well. In that I think what you will see from ESMA is really some thinking around some of the principles here. So I don't think we, we would expect her to have a template, a model agreement in this document for consultation. These will be the practices around enforcement and supervision and information sharing, etc., that needs to be in place. John's covered many of the points actually that were discussed yesterday. So the extent to which we can use this IOSCO uh, developed agreement with some tailoring to reflect the additional requirements of the f and I think that there was a very strong acknowledgement of the sort of longer term objective here around the passport and having these sort of multilateral network of, a, of, of agreements in place, but some realism around the extent to which that can be achieved and needs to be achieved. In the, in the short term. So I think there'll be some proposals around the combination of sort of having these bilateral agreements um, uh, and multilateral uh, over time moving to the multilateral space. I mean, I think that is the, the sort of direction of travel here, but some realism about what we can achieve in the short term. And the other issue, and I think it's very, very important, so I think we, we really spent a lot of time pushing for and focusing on it as Marie's is engagement. And indeed, I'm sure the, um, John and colleagues will attend uh, the open hearing that ESMA has, has committed to sort of um, holding in probably beginning of September or so with other regulators to work through some of these issues. So this is actively being considered, considered as, as a, a subject we, ESMA needs to deliver its advice by the middle of November. And I think the supervisory cooperation, okay, that's perhaps less relevant for you as practitioners, but I think the delegation parts of this paper will be particularly important to think about, particularly from a service provider point of view, to the extent to which you'll meet the requirements and continue to be, be able to provide services to European-based fund managers, and indeed, longer term, provide services to, uh, to non-European-based ones. I think it's very strange I sort of use the term non-European in the context of of Jersey, but, but such is the legal construction that we are and we're sort of under here. The other really key issue that that consultation will probably cover 
is uh, the points around depositories. And this is this cliff edge I was describing earlier when nothing applies from 2013 to 2015. But if the passport comes in, everything applies if you want to access that. And there'll be some, some provisions on, on that, sort of custodians, depositories, et cetera, that you'll need to, to use and, and the sort of regulation capital and um, supervision, et cetera, that they need to be under. So uh, hopefully I've at least met some of the expectations in terms of what I was able to say there. Um, uh, watch this space, I think. It is only a, uh, will only be a few weeks, I think, until the, the consultation is, is published. I think this is clearly a sort of topic we can perhaps take some, some, some questions on in, in the panel session. Just, um, just a sort of summary of, of, of what's next then. I mean, the, these, a lot of these points have been made already. So we have until mid-September for the ESMA consultation. We will see the final advice in mid-November. Our expectation is probably that the Commission may be around March, sort of April, um, the European Commission, March, April, sort of time next year will have a, a reasonably well worked up set of uh, regulations and directives uh, specifying these more detailed rules and then the, the Parliament and the, um, uh, the sort of council process will, um, will go from there. Um, so for European managers, um, the differential, um, James spoke about this a lot earlier, the differential between European managers and non-European ones will uh, really apply from the 22nd of July and indeed will certainly apply from the 22nd of July 2014 because um, that's when the European managers must be authorised under the directive and indeed the, the new private placement rules, the extra transparency requirements, etc. that you've heard about will apply. Again, the, the fourth, fourth bullet point, I, I made an apology earlier for including this on nearly every slide, but I just again want to understand the importance of engaging constructively. It really does help the task forces in ESMA uh, consider issues, but more importantly, uh, come up with, with solutions. So just to conclude, we're looking forward. 2015 has been spoken about a lot. Um, 2017, I can't even think that far into the future, frankly, at the, at the moment, but that is, um, that is when the Commission sort of undertakes a review. Uh, I won't use the words IRF and D2 um, uh, too much, but usually um, that is perhaps an outcome of such a, a, a review. Only time, time will tell. Um, you send, I think, a slide um, similar to the next one. When it comes up uh, from James and, um, uh, and Brendan all, also, but, uh, but I think this just illustrates the, the marathon that, um, that John was describing earlier.